Good morning. Welcome to, the, to Upton Hall. This is the home of the British Horological Institute and also the Museum of Timekeeping. Uh, we've had a museum here since 1988, uh, but in the early 90s, the Institute decided to protect the collection by creating a charitable trust that's now uh, run along those lines. Uh, the, we've been collecting, though, the collection has been uh, growing since the year 1858, so 160 years old or so, and we have a collection growing through all that time. Uh, among them, of course, is the clock here, one of the larger uh, timepieces we have. It's a clock that came from, you might just see it there, Clerkenwell, John Moore and son of Clerkenwell. Uh, Clerkenwell was the centre of the clock and watch trade in Britain for many centuries. Uh, in fact, I remember it as such, it's all mostly gone now. But uh, John Moore was one of those places, one of those companies that, uh, that made clocks like this in that part of London. The Institute's first headquarters were there as well, uh, in Northampton Square. Uh, we left there in 1972 and we opened here on the 1st of January 1973. And we've been here ever since. Well, we've moved through from the lobby area of the, uh, the entrance hall, We're now in the ground hall of the Horological Institute. Some of our finest clocks are here, but included among them is something that uh, you don't really notice until you come into the hall itself, and that is the enormous pair of hands that are behind me up, uh, up on the wall up there. Now, uh, we've just spoken about a turret clock in the, in the lobby area. These are the sort of hands that would have been driven by that clock. However, they are uh, particular hands, they actually belong to the original St Pancras Station platform clock, well, and now a very famous clock. Uh, the one that's there on, in St Pancras today is a reproduction, but these are the original hands from that clock. Uh, the first mechanical clocks were made in Europe probably towards the end of the 13th century, but the earliest clock we have in this collection uh, is an English one, uh, this one here. It's a lantern clock dating from 1650-1655. Now, uh, being of that date, it would have been controlled differently the way it is now. It has a pendulum on it now, but it wouldn't, when it was first made, it would have had a, a balance behind the, the frame up here. The remarkable thing is that uh, it's quite an old-fashioned looking clock, but only 20 years separates this clock from this one here, which is a long case clock by Joseph Nibb, um, and an enormous change has taken place in those uh, few years, uh, uh, technology has moved on, uh, the way in which things are constructed, new types of, uh, of wood were coming into this country. All sorts of things have happened, so you now have the long case clock rather than the wall hanging lantern clock. Um, it was necessary really because this clock here has only a small weight of about six or seven pounds. This though has two weights of 12 pounds each. So you've gone beyond what can safely hang on the wall. Now it has to have this structure underneath it to, to hold it up. Now we saw the technological changes that occur between the lantern clock and the long case just then, but other changes were also taking place but they were more decorative. And we have two examples here. One is of this case here, uh, which is called a marketry case, uh, which has a, a number of patterned uh, woods to create that scene of uh, flowers and leaves and vases and so on. Uh, the second example is this one here, which is uh, a, a case decorated in the oriental style in a way that we call Japanning. Uh, we took items of porcelain that had been bought from the Far East, perhaps furniture, took the decorative features that were on those and recreated them on clock cases like these. Uh, it, was very, it became very fashionable for about a century, these, this type of clock. Um, again, it is rather faded with the time, but it still uh, is a magnificent clock to look at. Now, we just looked at some uh, long case clocks which are highly decorative, uh, but there's a scientific aspect to this as well. And the trouble with the long case clock is it's got a long pendulum made of metal. And in hot weather, it, it expands uh, as all metal does and that means it ticks slower. So ways around this had to be found, and by the early 18th century, uh, a way had been found, again using metal, but in this case, two metals. Uh, the most obvious one is the one uh, behind me here, which has a mercurial pendulum. This is a pendulum with a steel rod, and the bob is made out of a glass jar filled with mercury. So as the steel rod expands downwards during hot weather, the mercury also expands, but expands upwards so the centre of gravity of the pendulum remains the same and its accuracy is hugely improved. 
probably the most spectacular clock in the collection uh, is this one in the centre of the hall, uh, which is actually is quite a modern clock made by a group of our members uh, back in 2008 uh, and a few years before that as well. It was made in honour of the 150th anniversary of the British Horological Institute and they came up with this design <coughs> of a suspended clock with uh, three pendulums uh, and uh, each pendulum is impulsed every six seconds and uh, with a digital dial uh, above there. It's quite a remarkable clock, as I say, it's, it's completely unique and works well. It is actually weight driven, this is the driving weight here, and the driving weight descends almost to the bottom, and then an electric motor will rewind it automatically. So uh, you won't see another one of these anywhere, because this is the only one. Now we have a lar very large number of uh, watches in the collection here, but one of the most interesting is the one behind me here. It's not a hugely valuable watch as such, but it is the watch that was used by Captain Scott in the Antarctic. It is actually only a uh, relatively inexpensive alarm watch, but it was used, as, uh, as far as we know, because in Antarctica you mustn't sleep for more than two hours if you're out on the uh, ice shelf because uh, your limbs begin to freeze. So as an alarm watch, it was used to wake him up uh, every uh, couple of hours or so, and then he would arouse his companions. They would then have to drink something hot and so on. That's what it was used for. We tried to copy here the famous photograph of Captain Scott in his den, which we also have here, and you can see the watch quite clearly there, together with its boot lace uh, and safety pin, which uh, went with it. The safety pin also to secure it to his clothing. We have a number of chronometers in the collection here as well. Now, chronometers are high precision clocks used at sea uh, for determining longitude. In fact, they were so important in the 19th century that the first gift that was ever given to the Institute is this one down here. This is a gift from the Admiralty, uh, which is a very fine uh, chronometer by David Maurice. Um, and it's, it's absolutely complete and still in working order, but it was, it was sent to us here so that our members, our students, our apprentices could learn how the best work was done and uh, they could study and inspect it. And we still have it here in the collection. Uh, now this may not look like a, a normal clock. In actual fact, it is the very first speaking clock made by the GPO in the early 1930s and which came into service for the first time in July 1936. Uh, it uses the latest technology from Hollywood in one sense in that it uses a soundtrack encased in glass discs. Uh, the sound is read by exciter lamps and, uh, and then it's sounded and the voice of sounds from that. Uh, it lasted 25 years um, and uh, still works well to this day, uh, that we don't run this all the time. It is run, uh, the whole thing is run by a low frequency motor at the back here, uh, and the, you can see the long shaft that holds the, the glass discs with the soundtrack on it. Uh, every 10 seconds a cam comes into operation and moves uh, the, the lamps along the, the disc. Every minute then two cams, every hour three or four cams are, are, are operational. So there's a lot of load on it, uh, but, it uh, but it still works well. And we do run it when we have visits. Uh, uh, we run it all the time when we have uh, open days here. At the first trip, it will be 12, 28, precisely. At the first trip... So that's a very brief glimpse of some of the treasures we have here at Upton Hall. Um, there's a lot more to see. I hope you will be able to take the time to come and see us. Uh, we're situated between Newark and Nottingham in England, and all the details of our opening times, etc., will be on our website. So we look forward to seeing you soon.